So my top three varieties of the five we grow, the three I would definitely grow again. My favorite is always. What's up Lazy Dog fam? Hope everybody out there is having an awesome day. It's still really wet around here, probably even wetter than it was when we did that last video. After we shot that last video, the next day it rained I think five different times, a bunch each time. The day after that it just absolutely flooded. Haven't had any rain today. It's trying to dry up but there's so much moisture. We still got puddles in some of our garden plots which is really unusual. So there's not a whole lot we can do but we're going to try to do a little cleanup today. We're going to be talking a lot about tomatoes on this video. We're going to do a little cleanup. We're gonna do kind of a recap of the tomato season, talking about the best determinate and indeterminate varieties we grew. And we're also gonna try to shed a little light on this whole fish in the hole situation and talk about whether or not we saw that that made a difference. So we'll start by talking about and doing a little cleanup. So here was where our indeterminate tomatoes were, you can see. They're no longer here. I was able to get out here between rainstorms the other day and go ahead and get these plants out of here. So all I did basically was come down here with a pair of pruners and loppers and just cut that stem at soil level right there where you see that kind of hole in the pine straw there. So I just cut them at the soil, cut off the string at the top and just hauled everything over there to my burn pile. We still gotta get this trellis system up right here. But that was pretty easy getting them out of here. I didn't want to pull up those plants or try to pull up those plants because I planted them way, way deep in there. And I think I can get away with just snipping them at the soil like that. Now later in the video, we'll kind of talk about the winners and losers from these two rows of indeterminate tomatoes here. I think we had eight different varieties planted and we'll also address that whole fish in the hole thing. But real quick, I wanted to talk about this trellis system here since this was the first year we've used this system for indeterminate tomatoes. I really, really like this system here. It took a little bit to kind of get the hang of installing it at first. It took me about an hour or so to probably set it up for these two rows, but I don't think it would take near that long doing it again next year. It was a little bit of an investment up front buying the conduit and all the connectors for this, but we've got them now and we can reuse this year after year. Now, when we first set up this trellis system, I wondered how should I do my string on the conduit here should I set it up so we could have some extra string there and kind of lower and lean the tomatoes as they grow or just tie a knot up top here because our tomato season was going to be over by the time they got to the top. And so what I found was with these seven foot tall T posts here there's really not enough time for me to need to do any lower and leaning. I planted these indeterminate tomatoes as early as I could have planted them this year and had some pretty good sized transplants. Some of them did make it a little taller than this conduit here, but you know, mid July is when our tomato season is usually done. So no real need for me to set it up to lower and lean, just tying a knot in the top worked just fine for me because like I said, the tomatoes are gonna be done by the time they get to the top or a little bit over the top of this conduit. Now, as far as the pruning goes, we pruned ours very aggressively, kept them on a single stem. And I found that there's some advantages to that. There's also some drawbacks to that. I've seen other pictures of people using this technique and they're using two or three lines of string per plant and letting the plants get a lot more bushy. But we pruned ours very aggressively, like I said. The benefit to that I found was I was able to keep the pests under control a lot easier because I had more of kind of an open plant growth habit there. I could spray the entire plant, undersides, tops of the leaves, and using that azera, I really didn't have any leaf-footed bug problems in here until probably the last couple of weeks when I just haven't been able to spray. Now the disadvantage to pruning so aggressively like that is that we do sacrifice a little production there. We're just getting production along that main stem. We're not getting a whole lot of side shoot production on those tomatoes. So yeah, we sacrificed some production, but keeping the plants open like that, I really liked how that worked out for me and I almost just rather plant more plants and keep them pruned aggressively, have them kind of open as opposed to planting fewer plants and not being able to control the pests as well. 
So the indeterminates are gone, and you can see a nice little mud puddle over there where our pumpkin plot was. So I know this right here is about to be kind of soggy, but I'm ready to get these determinants out of here. Just tired of them being in here. Gonna try to get them out today without making too big of a mess. I already pulled up or cut three plants there. Our Torangina cherry tomatoes, they started looking pretty rough. The plants are still inside those cages. So the way I usually like to do this is just cut the plant right at soil level there, pull up the entire cage, plant and all, and then let the plant kind of you know dry up decay a little bit and then it's a lot easier to pull out of that cage you try to pull a green plant out of that cage especially when it's all branched out like those are you can have you quite a fit so we'll let those dry out a little bit more we should be able to slip them out of those cages pretty easily and then we can fold up the cages and store them in the barn now as far as these determinants here go this might look like it's going to be a booger to take down and take apart with the florida weave but it's actually pretty easy because everything's kind of connected there so we just kind of take it apart section by section and i'll show you that in a minute but you can see the number that all this rain has done on these plants lately they were looking still okay just a week or two ago and i thought well maybe we'll get a few tomatoes a few more tomatoes off these but all this rain man just has them looking terrible and it's time for them to go so let me tell you my kind of game plan or strategy here and then we'll get it all took down. So the first thing I'm going to do is come in here and cut these plants just like we did those indeterminate plants. Now I think I can cut these with my pruning shears. I may have to get my loppers. We'll see. But anyway, I'm going to cut them right at soil level there. And then I'm going to take my knife and right down beside each of these posts, I'm just going to cut all the way down there to release that string. So cut it all the way on that side and then cut it all the way down on the inside of that post right there and then what i should be able to do is just kind of roll this up section by section we'll throw it in the back of the buggy there and then take it over to the burn pile Now, just as a disclaimer, I feel like I should mention this. When you take down a whole bunch of plants like I just did all at one time, you're probably going to end up smelling like rotten maters like I do right now. And if you live somewhere where you have gnats, it's probably going to make you more attractive to the gnats. But we got it done, and I'm glad to get them out of here. That took less than 10 minutes to get all those plants out of here, just kind of rolling them up, wrapping them up like that. Now, we still have our stakes here. I got to cut the twine off those t-post and even though i do have a t-post puller i'm not going to try to pull these out of the ground when it's soaking wet like that because it's just suctioned in there so i'll get these t-posts out of here with a t-post puller once it dries up a little bit and just to show you how wet it is around here look at that standing water at the beginning of my basil row there I've never seen these plots hold standing water like this in consecutive days. Never have I seen it, but there's just nowhere for it to go. So now with that over there gone and those determinate plants gone, almost all our tomatoes are out of here except for this little short row right here, which I'm going to leave for probably another week or so, hanging on for just a few more fruits, especially on this Turkey Creek variety here. So I'm going to let those hang out maybe a few more weeks, but they won't be out here for much longer than that and now that the 2022 tomato season is pretty much a wrap this is the time when we like to talk about some general conclusions and kind of give some winners and losers amongst all the different varieties we planted we'll separate this by talking about determinants first and then the indeterminates because you can't really compare determinants to indeterminates so we'll talk about our favorite varieties that we grew from each of those categories so starting out with the determinants. Now we talked about those a good bit on a couple previous videos. We did kind of an early season analysis on those and then kind of a mid to late season breakdown as well. But I'll kind of give you my general conclusions. 
So my top three varieties of the five we grow, the three I would definitely grow again. My favorite as always is Red Snapper. And then the Roadster and Rambler seem extremely similar to me. I don't know that I could tell them apart if you just had them planted side by side and I didn't know which was which. I like both of those. Both of those are nice tomato varieties, nice determinate varieties with good disease resistance. They held up down here in this crazy heat we had in the spring and early summer. So my keepers out of the determinants would be Red Snapper, Rambler, and Roadster. I would grow all three of those again. I'll definitely be growing Red Snapper next year. Not sure if I'll grow both Roadster and Rambler. I might just pick one of those two, but can't go wrong with either one in my opinion. Now the two determinants I probably won't grow again would be Grand Marshal and Thunderbird. Thunderbird just didn't really impress me at all. There was nothing really that great about it throughout the entire season. The plant vigor wasn't that good. The production wasn't that good. The tomato size wasn't that good. So definitely not growing Thunderbird again. Grand Marshal, the plant vigor was pretty terrible. It was maybe the worst out of all five varieties, but it was really, really productive, but the tomatoes weren't that big, and I tend to like bigger tomatoes as far as those red determinant tomatoes go. So Grand Marshal, I would say, is probably a really good one if you live in an area that doesn't have quite the intense heat and humidity as down here, but uh, for us, it's just not going to make the cut. And then as far as the indeterminate or heirloom varieties go, things aren't so, you know, black and white as far as winners and losers. But I'll tell you my favorites. There may be one or two that I'm probably not going to grow again, but I really enjoyed most of them that we grew this year. So if we're talking about indeterminate winners, ones I must grow again, we'll start out with the cherry tomato, the Torangina variety that we had planted over there. Just absolutely amazed at the production of that and the plant vigor was really, really good up until these last couple weeks here. Yes, those seeds are absolutely outrageous. I think it's seven or eight dollars for 15 seeds on Johnny's website. They are really, really expensive. But I can tell you, three plants was way more than we needed. One or two plants would be plenty, even for a big family. So if you've got a gardener, neighbor, or got some gardening friends nearby, you don't want to spend eight dollars for 15 seeds. You know, y'all just go in and split it. Somebody grow out all the plants and you can share the plants and everybody can enjoy that wonderful production. If you like Sun Sugar or Sun Gold, both of those compared to the Torangina in taste. The Torangina doesn't crack near as bad as Sun Gold. It was just great all, all around, and I can't brag on that variety enough. And then as far as the bigger indeterminate tomatoes go, let's talk about a few that I really, really like. Number one would be that Rose Tomato. Not only was it just a beautiful tomato, but it just had a wonderful taste to it. The plants held up really good, even through some of those 104 degree days we had. So Rose is definitely a winner for me. I think you can find those seeds online. I can't remember whose website I saw them on, but I think you can find those Rose seeds online. Someone sent us the seeds we planted, but I think you can buy those. Secondly would be that Turkey Creek tomato. We talked about that a few videos ago how you know the acidity was so awesome on that one still got a few of those plants over there someone sent me a link i think you might can buy those online but also the guy mike that sent me those seeds messaged me and said he was going to try to have a bunch of them and as soon as i'm able to point you in the right direction as far as where you can get them i'll let you know so you can try that variety the third one i really like would be the paul robeson thought the production was good, the plants held up good, and the flavor, the kind of smoky flavor on those dark tomatoes like that was just really, really good. I was impressed with the Paul Robeson, first time I've grown that one. The Georgia Streak, I really liked. It had good flavor, and the size on it was quite impressive. I think it may have been one of the biggest producing varieties or biggest fruit producing varieties we grew and uh, that was just a free seed packet we got with an order but uh definitely probably be going growing georgia streak again and the last one that i really really liked as far as the indeterminates go would be that georgia peach variety that heavenly hills homestead sent us i think you can get that one on baker creek site as well not a very big tomato just kind of small about you know that size a little smaller than a tennis ball but really really tasty looks like a peach it's almost got kind of a fuzzy exterior to it just a great little snack to have in a garden not really big enough to put on a sandwich just a good snack in tomato 
And then there were some other indeterminates that we grew and liked, but maybe they just didn't blow me away like those other uh, five or six did. Those would include the Kellogg's, the Dr. Wachi, German Johnson, and the Big Zach. All great varieties. I'd highly recommend them anyone. I don't know that I'll grow them again next year. I might. Nothing wrong with those, but they just weren't quite as impressive to me or didn't quite, you know, amaze me as much as some of those others like the Rose and the Turkey Creek and the Paul Robeson. Now, the one indeterminate that we probably won't grow again would be that giant crimson variety. Now, there's nothing wrong with that variety. It's, it's a good variety, produces well. The story behind it's really cool. How in my garden, you know, found those old seeds and is trying to bring that variety back. But there's just nothing about it that just blew me away, so to speak. It did probably produce more fruits than any of the other indeterminate varieties or heirloom varieties we had planted over here, but the fruits were kind of small and just seemed like a kind of standard red tomato to me. Didn't really taste any different than my determinate tomatoes I have over there. So nothing wrong with it. It's a good producer. I just probably won't grow it again. So those were our kind of winners and losers from the 2022 tomato season. And as I always say, don't let my results really sway you too much one way or the other. Just because something doesn't perform well for us down here doesn't mean it might not do great for you where you live. So give them a try. See if you like it at least one year. If you don't like a variety, don't grow it again. If you do like it, you know, keep it in the rotation. So now let's talk about this whole fish in the whole thing. Now if you've been following along, you know I buried a fish, pretty decent sized fish, beside one of these plants amongst these two rows of indeterminate tomatoes here. Before we get into it a little deeper, let me just say I have no motives behind trying to disprove this theory of a fish in a hole. If you like putting a fish in the hole, keep putting a fish in the hole. Don't let me discourage you from doing so. I just wanted to try it, see if there was any noticeable differences between having a fish in a hole and not having a fish in a hole beside a tomato plant. So that 15 or 16 inch speckled trout that I buried somewhere in here was actually buried about right there. It was buried beside the third plant from the beginning of this row. That was a Paul Robeson plant we had there. I understand this would make much more sense if the plants were still here, but it was buried beside that third plant there and I couldn't ever tell any considerable difference in performance between any of those Paul Robeson plants right there. If anything, the plants, the first two plants at the beginning of the row did a little better than that third plant there, but nothing significant as far as differences between the fish in the whole plant and any of these other plants. Now my thoughts on the whole fish in the hole thing has always been that that fish is not going to break down enough in a three to four month long tomato season to provide nutrients to that plant that is planted beside it. Now I think if you're burying a fish every single year and putting plants in that spot every single year there's going to be some residual effect that starts to build up and you might see some notable differences. But just one fish in one tomato season I just don't think it breaks down fast enough to make a difference for that plant in the first year. Now one thing I am interested to see is if there is anything left of that fish that I buried right there. Now I kept an eye on this spot so I know none of the animals dug it up or anything. I didn't see a lot of ants right here, although some ants under the ground could have eaten it. But let me go grab a shovel, let's dig around and see if we see anything left of that fish. Alright Mr. Fish, see if you're still here or not. There's a worm, a big old worm right there. Big old earthworm. Look at that guy. That's a nice one. Well, no signs of Mr. Fish. Saw a good many big earthworms in there, but no signs of a fish. I even started digging around the second plant. I thought, well, maybe I'm crazy, even though I wrote it down in my notebook just as soon as I buried it by that third plant. I thought, well, maybe it was the second one. Dug there, found more earthworms, no signs of fish. So maybe I was wrong by saying the fish won't break down in just three or four months if we go by what we just saw right here. That fish went somewhere. It got broke down 
somehow or another maybe it was all those worms in the soil that did the breakdown so if the fish was indeed broken down in the soil as our evidence here suggests why didn't we see a difference in that one plant that had the fish buried beside it well my best guess would be because we were pushing these plants so hard especially when it got really really hot early in spring we were feeding these guys a bunch of agrothrive we were just pushing them pushing them pushing them through all that stress and so the amount of nutrients that that fish was providing was probably negligible compared to all the other stuff we were feeding these plants maybe if you had a test where you didn't give this plant anything and then you just put a fish beside this plant maybe you could be able to tell a the difference there but i think since we were feeding these so heavily the effects of the fish you know just really couldn't be seen so that's my best guess and let me know your best guess in the comments below are you pro fish or are you no fish and if you're pro fish why didn't i see any benefits from the fish i buried so i hope you enjoyed the video today we're gonna wrap it up now i'm gonna try to get some of this grass cutting these high spots around the yard before it becomes a jungle on me if you're watching on youtube make sure to check out our affiliate links below a lot of great companies that we use in our gardens here at lazy dog farm even got some coupon codes for some of those companies so you can take advantage of those discounts if you haven't already go check out our website lazydogfarm.com where we've got our blog recommended products hats shirts all kind of good stuff over there if you did enjoy this video make sure to subscribe hit that notification button like and share and we'll see you next time right here at lazy dog farm Oh, well.